Good morning. Time for another daily devotion. And our devotion this morning uh, comes again from Psalm 22. Uh, and we pick it up at verse 19. Uh, and if we run through from 19 to 24, um, today we will be in good form. Uh, so I, again, yesterday, if you are following these sequentially, uh, yesterday we ended with 19 as a little bit of comfort, uh, but we'll pick up again with 19 here um, because this will be thematic for this chunk that we're going to do today. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions, save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. So this is a smaller chunk, and I'm saving 25 onward because um, uh, really quickly, and you'll hear more about that tomorrow, 25 onward is a description of the last day for those who fear and love in God. Um, and so we've got this little section here. So we'll walk through uh, the, the first little strophe here, uh, verses 19 through 21. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, from my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Okay, so in this little section, uh, the psalmist David prays against all of the things that he was encircled by. He talked about them in the last time, and he let God know about them, uh, that they were there. Now he's specifically asking that God would save him from all of those things. So yesterday we talked about maybe using those and picturing those, those adversaries uh, and using them helpfully, but now we need to have them gone. Um, one, there's a little um, translational humor here uh, when it says the power of the dogs. Um, that's not actually what's written there. Uh, it says literally from the hands of the dogs. Um, and th this got changed because dogs don't have hands. They have paws. That surprises no one. But here, if you remember, there's a kind of a little foreshadowing that's going on, and I would rather leave it as hands simply because of the Jezebel thing. Um, that I think that God is foreshadowing Jezebel and uh, or alluding to Jezebel here uh, through the inspiration. Uh, so I think it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek sort of inspirational, not joke, but at least illusion. So I'm inclined to leave that as hands. Uh, if you don't like Jezebel showing up early in a prophetic sort of a sense, um, sorry. <laughs> um, you don't have to, you don't have to go there. Um, but this part is, is important for us because now that we have uh, seen all that surrounds us and maybe depending on what your devotion was like yesterday maybe we have uh, used the the our foes that have encircled us um, to kill off uh, some of our our emotional baggage or our sin um, now we need them gone and so here is just a direct hey no don't leave me alone with these people don't leave me alone with these things uh, and they're named um, and he lists the dogs first um, I'm not going down the dog person kind of of road here um, but he list them kind of in reverse order. So he's got the stuff in verse 16 about the dogs, uh, and then he's got the lions, and then he's got the bulls. And so notice here he goes backwards uh, in, in talking about what he's upset about. Okay, there's a pause here. There's no real end. There's not a uh, Salem or... Um, uh, anything like that here he just skips and this is important because he assumes God has heard him and assumes God is going to take care of him um, and so there's a level of faithfulness here that we can really lean into and read into especially during Holy Week he doesn't even have this pleading about all the things that he's going to do and that's not where this is coming from 
So one way to view verse 22 and following is this kind of bargaining with God. If you do this, then I will do this. Um, But verse 23 and 24, 23b, well, I I suppose really just 24, uh, puts the lie to this, um, this idea of bargaining or or tit for tat sort of a deal. Um, No, he's doing this because he's just assumed that God has already taken care of it. God is faithful, and he will take care of all of these things for me. So I don't really need to worry about all this stuff. Okay, so that's verse 24 informs the reading for 22 and 23. Why are we declaring the name of God to our brothers and sisters? Um, And those who fear the Lord praise him. Um, So the picture here is a picture of God's done wonderful things, and I just have to tell absolutely everybody. And this is difficult in the age of coronavirus. Uh, It's difficult in the modern age simply because we're all busy and we don't get together for daily church and it's not something. But if you can remember the joy the church had when somebody from the congregation came and said, it's finally happened, this thing that I've been praying for or that the whole church has been praying for, it's finally over, it's finally done, or it's finally come true. Uh, And what a joy and what a blessing. That's the idea here. Um, so, of course, in verse 24, there is, and on the eve of Monday, Thursday, right, Holy Wednesday has its own themes, but it's also Monday, Thursday, Eve. Um, a closer reading of verse 24 is probably good. For God has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. This verse here shoots back against verse 1, uh, where it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from hearing me? And as Jesus uh, cries out to God the Father in verse or in, on the cross and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And quotes Psalm 22, he knows that the right response is verse 24. But it's going to take some faith for us because in the midst of Monday, Thursday, especially Good Friday and Holy Saturday, um, we have to have faith because all is lost, right? There is a big sense of everybody, all the bad guys won and Jesus is dead and it's never going to be okay again. Um, And... um, Then Easter Sunday, there's the surprise, right? And we live into it. And I'm not overly fond of all of the dramatics and all of the reliving through this um, because we know the story. But as we live Holy Week, there is that sense until Easter of waiting with bated breath to see, has God really heard the cries of Jesus? Has he responded? And um, Jesus responds back in the Gospels, right? Jesus and St. Paul together say, God raised Jesus from the dead. God heard Jesus. Uh, and Psalm 16, of course, you have not let your Holy One see decay. You have not let him left him in the pit. So we have those kinds of things. But in the midst of Holy Week, um, verse 24 is probably good. Uh, so what to do with this devotionally after all the kind of the academic talk and kind of moving through uh, the psalm? I think I would focus in on, unless you have a really recurrent sense of fear um, about our our uh, health position right now, um, in which case, uh, pray uh, verses 19 through 21 uh, repetitively. Just memorize 19 through 21 and pray them over and over and over and over again. Um, So if that's where you're at, um, that repetition, that praying the Psalms, that, as Luther will say, drumming into God's ears our petitions and requests through his word even better. Um, There is a great deal of comfort in that because we get to do something um, as well as we're using God's own word to say, hey, come on, let's, let's get with the this sounds impious, but let's get with the program here. Let's let's hurry up and come save me. I can't wait all day. I can't live like this forever. Uh, so again, it sounds impious, and maybe we don't want to entirely take that tone with God, um, but we certainly feel it, uh, and God knows we're feeling it. So uh, maybe don't take that tone with God, but on the other hand, continue to, in the words of Luther, drum into God's ears all of your petitions, and especially through his word. And that's not where we are. 
I would say verses 22 and 23 give us a a list and devotionally maybe write out or journal how you're gonna how you want to celebrate the end of all of our sufferings and to make a plan um and especially not just uh i'm going to make the cheese dip and i'm going to have a rack of ribs and some beers and these are the people i'm going to invite over right which is fine i mean you can make those plans too but here we're talking about spiritual things what are you going to do spiritually to celebrate um and it's important to think about um and so we have that uh, as a devotional sort of how would God have us celebrate? How would God have us tell our story of how he has worked marvelously on our behalf? And, you know, for some of us, um, this has been no big deal. We just sat at home and watched TV for six weeks or eight weeks or 17 weeks, uh, however long this, this kind of goes on. Uh, but for some of us, this has really kind of put us on the rack, as it were, the actual, you know, the stretching the guy with the hands and the feet, uh, emotionally, because we didn't get what we wanted. We didn't get Easter. We didn't get a good Holy Week. We didn't get Lent. Um, everything's been ruined. Um, and so it's right to plan out a spiritual celebration, right? If this has just been, I'm doing what the government says, and, and I don't really care, and it doesn't really bother me, I'm just being a good citizen, then that's there's not as much to celebrate about. Um, but man, if you are in the bottom of the, the pit on this, then um, make some plans. And it's good and right, right? You're planning to praise God. Not, not that you can't praise him now, but you're planning on a specific way to praise God uh, in all of this. Uh, down in the link, or down in the links in the description, I'm going to put a link for um, what's called a logical technical analysis of the psalm. Or if you're a Jew, um, uh, Gematria, um, this guy goes through and assigns letters and numbers and words and numbers and tries to figure out the psalm with math. Uh, if you speak Hebrew, if you read Hebrew, it's very interesting. If you've never seen something like this done before, again, it's interesting and horrifying. Uh, but there's a little point down about three quarters of the way down where he starts talking about a menorah pattern. Uh, and this is in the observations at the end section. If you're interested, again, in how the psalm is set up, the menorah pattern of, pro, of the kind of an ascending and descending thing, especially as we're in Passover and Lent, um, that could be interesting. So I will say, put a link down there and you can go and read that in your, in your own time. Uh, I guess finally, um, 24 is this bridge. 24 is a bridge between what God has done and we're already assuming what he's done and a bridge to talking about the last day because the last day starts when Jesus rises from the dead. And I know that that's not a popular Christian American sort of thing. You know, we're waiting for the mark of the beast and all that stuff. Um, but that's none of that's actually scriptural <laughs> in terms of, of the last day. Um, what we should be waiting for is Jesus, right? The whole Bible tells the story of salvation. We should be waiting for Jesus. And so when Jesus rises from the dead, he's vindicated um, and uh, all of our sins are gone away. So 24 works as this bridge. And so um, if none of that, the, the, fo the foregoing stuff has been good for, uh, or fruitful for you devotionally, maybe look at verse 24 and um, pray through um, how God is going to take care of you in the future um, and how he can strengthen his love and trust or it, that already grows in you uh, and um, how he can further prepare you for the last day and the end times um which are already going on not because of you know whatever thingy we saw but just because it starts at the resurrection the last day starts at the resurrection and comes to completion on that great day when our lord jesus will descend from the clouds with trumpets notice it doesn't say saxophones or accordions there it's trumpets um sorry dad um so, uh, but 24, it's a different way to pray through 24. Instead of focusing on um, what God has done for Jesus, it's how is God going to um, deliver us and prepare us for the end? Because um, 
the psalmist sees himself as the afflicted one. We see Jesus as the afflicted one, but we can bounce back again and see ourselves as the afflicted one again as well. Uh, this has gone on quite long enough for today, uh, and so I don't want to bore you. Have a great day uh, in the Lord, and stay safe and stay healthy.